This is a podcast from The Bugle. Hello and welcome to Catharsis. I'm Tiff Stevenson, full-time comedian, part-time, massively unqualified therapist for this podcast only. Each week I talk to my guest about small things that are pet peeves and maybe big things that need some catharsis. As is tradition, before I introduce my guest, I like to just get into one of my issues and um, I, I'm going to call this like a middle-age health emergency, but I woke up in the middle of the night and went to the loo and I was like, oh, I've pissed blood. And it took me a panicked run into the bedroom and scrabbling for my phone before realizing that I'd eaten a beetroot salad. And I need something. I don't know, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether I need a sign or some kind of signal to prevent me from panicking in the bathroom in the middle of the night. Before I started calling NHS 111 and going, I've got pee, I've got blood in my pee. Like, how do I deal with this? This seems like a very... I never did this in my 20s. <laughs> Maybe I never looked in the toilet after I peed. <laughs> and I feel it's something about the middle of my life that I'm like up in the middle of the night to pee anyway before I could, I could sleep through. And now I'm like, oh my God, I've got blood in my piss. So I don't know how we fix this. I don't know whether I need like to take a sticker off the beetroot and just put it on my arm like a tattoo. But when I go to bed that night and wake up, I'll look at my arm and remember that I've eaten beetroot. I don't know if my guest has had this problem, but I'm going to introduce him. Um, I'm very excited to have have him on the podcast. He's a comedian. He's also a podcaster. He's a raconteur. He's a man of many talents. Uh, please welcome to the podcast, John Robbins. Hello to you, Tiff, and hello to everyone listening. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Ah, you're so welcome. Uh, do you ever think you've pissed blood in the middle of the night? It never goes into the bladder when I've had beetroot, but there's been the odd... Um, well, you know, slightly more red flag area of um, the old uh, the beetroot passing. Uh, and what I tend to do is just leave a beetroot on top of the toilet system. <laughs> okay. yeah. um, or hang it from the... A good thing to do is if you get an actual raw beetroot with its sort of... Um, the uh, little sort of sprig still attached, if you tie that to your bathroom light cord... <laughs> then when you pull it in the night, it's so just a reminder that you've had beetroot. Yeah, this is what we need, a warning system. <laughs> Looking into the toilet is is more of a, a middle-aged thing. <laughs> it, and it's sort of... Um, <laughs> it's sort of working out your transition timings uh, and the various stages your digestion goes through. You kind of look down and go, huh, huh. I only had that last night, and there it is. <laughs> all, all, all systems are go. I seem to have um, become massively aware of, and I think this was like after I turned forty, massively aware of my asshole all the time. Just an awareness of it in a mm. way that I never had before. Just like I know it's there; it makes itself known. Well, I've got um. So I'm just getting ready to go up to Edinburgh to do a show up there and then I'm touring it afterwards. And not I don't want to put anyone off buying tickets, but there is there is quite a long story that begins with a toilet assessment. And from that panic, sort of a, a, a whole other health problem emerged because of the tests I had. But I did have my first colonoscopy. Um which I don't really talk about in the show because I've heard so many comedians talk about them so well. <laughs> but I don't yes. think I've got anything to add. But um, it was quite, a, it was a uniquely uncomfortable experience because you think, you kind of think I've experienced every type of pain and discomfort. I've had every type of, you know, rash, itch, scratch, cut, bruise, break. But then when someone fills your entire t intestines with air, it's like, oh, wow, this is a whole whole new sensation <laughs> it's a whole new world yeah. a whole anyway that is punny and uh well look i uh i i'm gonna come see your show because <laughs> because now i want to know about this <laughs>
before we get into what you're going to be up to, because we will discuss that at the end of the uh, pod, uh, let's get into let's get into what you've brought to us today. Because we always start the podcast by talking about an old grudge, mm. and if you have one, if you're holding on to it, you might have already let it go. But share it with me. Well, it's really interesting to chat to you at this juncture about uh, frustrations and resentments and annoyances and gripes and grudges, because. I'm currently like in a sort of a personal development journey of getting rid of all my resentments I've ever had. And I mean like an actual practical process of doing that, like writing them all out, going through them one by one. Um, and the one, the sticking one, the one that I found hardest to get rid of is all my resentments against myself. <laughs> so... I've got a grudge against me. Well, I've got hundreds of grudges against me. Um, and those are the ones that I can't shift because I sort of have to live in the world that all my mistakes have created. <laughs> and, you know, there's so many reminders about my mistakes. Like, I mean, even even coming home to the house I live in on my own, like in the evening, you're like... Oh, I'm just going to watch a film and relax and have the evening off and go to bed on my own because uh, you fucked it all up. <laughs> so, you know. Well, I've said this before. That's why when I think about Edinburgh, when I think about reviewers, when I think about all of this, is that no one, no one is ever going to be harsher than the voice in our head, in our own inner critic, in our own person that's in here going, oh, you did that. Yeah. You did. That. Is there someone to blame for this? Oh, it's me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's me, all right. And also, the the only time I've ever really reviews or anything like that has got to me is when the criticism has been absolutely right, and you kind of like, oh, you've got me there. I knew that bit didn't work. I knew that bit was too long. I knew that bit was too baggy. Um, and it's you can't be shouting and screaming at whoever's writing for the Telegraph or the Guardian or whatever when they've absolutely done a number on you. Um, but yeah, it's a bit like, you know, if you've ever tried to do DIY badly yourself as opposed to throwing a bit of money at getting an expert involved. <laughs> and every time you come back to that, you know, kitchen cupboard that doesn't quite close, it's just a constant reminder that kitchen cupboard is saying to you, you did this because you're rubbish. <laughs> and you are completely useless and you didn't get the right tools and you didn't clean the kitchen before you started to do it you were using like a knife to screw in a thing because you couldn't be bothered to borrow a screwdriver and you dropped a mug because you hadn't cleared the work surface and so this is a constant reminder of how limited your skill set is well, we are doing the best we can, I suppose, with the tools that we're given. I do think it's interesting that you're that you're doing this work because I think oftentimes as comedians, and I've said this, I said this about myself, but I would say it of all comedians, like talking about your problems on stage is not the same as doing something about them. Oh, <laughs> so, so, 100%. <laughs> so we can become like these like super aware people on stage that were like, and I do this and I do it. And I go, yeah, but this isn't actually... <laughs> Oh, yeah. This isn't actually dealing with it. Like people who got, kind of go like, yeah, no, I'm an, I'm an asshole when I did this. And that was just like bang out of order. But I, I'm aware, guys, I'm aware I'm the bad guy. And then you go, okay, but are you going to fix that? Oh, no. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> you know, and we yeah. can all, we, we can all sort of engage in that as well. I think it feels comforting. It feels like if I'm saying it on stage, then that's, that's that dealt with. <laughs> what, what? Yeah, it's so true. There are so many people who are essentially going, Oh, I'm a terrible arsehole, me. Anyway, um, yeah, sorry about that. I'll probably do it again because that's just me. That's who I am. And actually, like, changing your relationship with anger is really difficult because anger can be quite a comfortable place to be. It stops you having to sort of uh, address your role in stuff because you're blaming other people. And what I've noticed is the more I... Whenever I get angry with something now, I think, okay, why are you getting angry about this? And I'll be like, oh, it might be because someone's not listening to me or someone's not doing what I want them to do. And if you actually go through that, you think, well, that's, you're, you're angry because you're not getting what you want. And actually, you know, none of us get what we want in life. So you can either scream and shout at this traffic light that you think is set to red for too long, or you can just put on a podcast and chill out because you getting angry isn't going to make the light turn green. Otherwise, there'd be no red lights in traffic. 
Um, someone not doing what you want is a really is a really interesting one, isn't it? Oh yeah. Just because someone hasn't done what I want, I did. I didn't get what I want, but someone hasn't behaved the way I. We always have in our head. You go, well, I do it this way, and this is this is an ex- acceptable way to behave. And you go, but not everyone is me, and not everyone respond. Not everyone has the same time. But, I mean, I'm terrible with time anyway. I so, said, like for me, time is like a Salvador Dali painting. It's all melted clocks. I'm suddenly in the middle of the desert. No idea that I was supposed to be somewhere at two, at two mm. p.m. <laughs> meeting someone for coffee. But you know, like people uh, have like a different concept of time, a different concept of what sounds friendly. Like, and then like when we, when we start putting a pot that upon other people of like, well, they should respond this way because this is how I would respond. And then I have to go to myself because I do this. I have to go. Oh, they're not you, Tiffany. So maybe it's fine. And then I've built this whole narrative that someone hates me because they took longer or didn't reply to something in a arbitrary yeah. time frame that I've <laughs> that I've agreed in my brain. <laughs> Lou Sanders sent me a really good little um sort of mantra that was on Instagram and often like this this sort of language of self-help and self-improvement can seem very glib and quite frustrating especially if you're experiencing real difficulty in your life. But this woman was saying that you know that her new mantra is let them. So she's like, so your friends didn't invite you to the thing, let them. Your partner didn't remember this event, let them. And once you actually, and it sounds so sort of thick and dumb and easy. And it's like, well, that's easy for you to say, but blah, blah, blah. But actually quite a few occasions when things, people don't behave the way you want them to. If you just say, let them. then suddenly all of that like stress dissipates. <laughs> because the stress is only going to hurt you. Yes. But I think a, like a little bit of power is quite a dangerous thing. And this certainly applies in like stand up, but also in in like office politics, in in hierarchies of businesses, in families. Because if you think you have some kind of some kind of inherent right to be listened to and to have your instructions followed, that may be the case, you know, your boss may have the final word or whatever, and they may make the wrong call, but it doesn't give them the right to act like an asshole. you know? <laughs> yeah. So if yeah. you're that person with a little bit of influence or the person with the final say or, you know, in, in, my, in my situation, you know, when I go to do the radio show on a Friday, there's a team of people there to do stuff to enable me to do the radio show. And one of my grudges against myself is that when I walk into that studio in a mood, for whatever reason it is, I am a right pain. I'm just, a, and it's not like, I know I know presenters who, who I won't name, but who are real like shouters and screamers and chucking coffee cups and like, there's oh, you put sugar in this, this kind of like insane behaviour. Whereas I'm like, just totally shut down. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to do that, but the, the, the paper wasn't there. Yeah. So I really <laughs> pasag. Kind of, a bit yeah, of Passag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Passag. Um the sort of little uh phrase we have going around our WhatsApp group is John is typing. Because <laughs> <laughs> like whenever they say something like um so it's me and Ellis for the radio show on a Friday and then we have uh, three producers and if they're like, Oh sorry, someone's had to cancel because of whatever, can we reschedule this podcast record? And Ellis will always be like, yeah, that's fine. And Dave will be like, yeah, there's, that's fine. And they'll be like, John is typing. <laughs> so I'm trying to be a lot less John is typing about things. Yes. And much more. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Go with the flow. Let them. Let go. I am. I mean, I, I do have stand up about this, but I, I'm, not, I'm not mad about the PASAG. I quite like, I don't like passive aggressive. I prefer aggressive aggressive. I kind of like the, let's just say the thing and sometimes get it out of the way because because the passive aggressive just has so many layers of unpacking that I'm like, oh, this is exhausting. Could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be this? I felt like the tone was different. Whereas sometimes when someone just goes, oh, fuck off. I'm like, okay, all right. So we got, we can address this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it's can, out in the open. <laughs> we can, let's, let's get to the nub of what the, you know, I feel away and, uh, yeah, because uh, a, pa- a a passag can just like layer, start layering and layering and layering and layering, and then it's just what beca- what starts as a thin layer of resentment becomes then like a a crust of 
discontent. <laughs> I've never said that before, but I think, <laughs> I think that makes sense. <laughs> I tell you what I'm doing a lot at the minute is apologising to people, not just for like how I've been in the past, but immediately whenever I feel I've like stepped over a line or been a bit rude, I'll, I'm will i trying to train myself to immediately apologise. And it's so freeing. So I'll give you an example. I was doing a comedy festival in Wells. We we're staying at this B&B and um, went down for breakfast in the morning. And uh, the the cooked breakfast was £14.50, right? Fair enough. Hotel prices are nuts. £14.50 for a full cooked breakfast, whatever. But I didn't want that because it was all meat. Um, and I don't eat meat. So under the uh, the list of cooked breakfast, one of the options was sort of toast with beans. And I said, oh, could I get um, could I get toast with beans uh, and just a, a poached egg instead of the full cooked breakfast? And the waitress said, yeah, uh, unfortunately, all of the cooked breakfasts are fourteen fifty. And I said, what? So so beans on toast with an egg is fourteen fifty. And she said, yeah. And I said, are you insane? <laughs> because that is insane. Right? Yes. <laughs> However, it's not that waitress's fault that the, the policy of the B&B <laughs> is insane. But I, I could not believe it. So I looked her in the eye and said, are you insane? She said, yeah, I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And so I said, well, I won't have anything then. I'll just have, I'll just have a black coffee. So in that situation, I've been, I've been quite rude to someone whose not job it is it's not their job to set the price, but I'm also hungry, and that's yes, a bad yeah, moment yeah. for me. And there's injustice in there, and yeah. there's also the like that. Well, this is this is insane. So fix the problem because this doesn't make sense. So yes. So let's have a solution to this problem, which is to charge me I don't know five less. quid or whatever. Yeah, um, <laughs> substantially less. <laughs> But, for a piece of toast and some beans and an egg. <laughs> but my anger only hurt me because I'm now not eating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really hungry. So afterwards, I went out and got some breakfast somewhere else with my kind of big self-righteous stomp. And I went to the sort of local cafe and had a full breakfast for seven pounds. Like a veggie <laughs> breakfast. I thought, I've saved myself seven pounds fifty. That b and is insane. And then, then I thought, once I'd eaten, I thought, do you know what? you didn't really deal with that very well. So I went back and I said, uh, I found the waitress and I said, look, I'm really sorry. You, I, 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 I shouldn't have said that. And also it's not your fault at all. Um, you were really, really nice with us. And, um, I, and I, and I gave her 20 quid as, as like a tip in the tip jar and just said, please buy you and, um, your colleagues a round of drinks. Cause I really feel bad about that. And I walked away from that feeling so... I had no stress to take into the day then. Yeah, yeah. Whereas had I not done that, I would have not only still been angry about the fucking beans, I would have been angry at myself for getting angry with her. So it's quite a good habit to get into, to like immediately make amends for any time you've sort of stepped over the line. I'm having my first session with a new therapist this afternoon. Oh, I'm excited for you. Please don't take anything that I offer up as any kind. <laughs> oh, well, I'll say, I'll say to her, actually. Say my I've guru, seen Tiff Stevenson. Yeah, my, my guru, guru Tiff uh, wouldn't agree with this approach. <laughs> but uh, she's something called core process psychoanalysis, which is like a sort of crossover between psychoanalysis and sort of mindfulness and Buddhism and meditation. Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah, and it's to sort of help me because I've stopped drinking a few months ago, and it's I want to find a way to meditate better and to like process emotions when they come because usually I would just get I would just drink and I would just be like, hmm, don't feel particularly good about this. Probably have a few drinks and then it goes away. Well, I don't have the drink anymore to make the the feelings go away. So I'm I'm quite excited to see what the kind of um, what the uh, strategies are and how to meditate better because I am so bad at it. Um, there's a few, well, and I mean, I feel like this will be this would be a whole other section of the podcast. But um, you might have read Gabor Mate or looked at some of Gabor Mate's work. And it's... she told me she that was the book she recommended. She said you should read Gabor Mate. I'm currently reading a book called Thoughts Without a Thinker. Um, but I bought the I've got it here in the realm of hungry ghosts. <laughs> All right. It's called. 
Ah, okay. I have, I mean, I've got them all on there and I, he talks, I mean, there's quite deep, he's fantastic. Let's just do, we'll talk about this off podcast, but let's just do a recommend to anyone that's listening. Gabor Mate is fantastic. and does a lot of work in, um, with ADHD around NLP, neuro linguistic programming. If you're interested in that, and about addiction and 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 stuff from childhood, he's he's incredible. He's very good. Well, thank you for bringing your old grudge. I feel like we should get into the next section of the podcast. It's time for topical cream. This is the section of the podcast where we asked a guest to bring us a stingy news story that's got them all het up. What's got you riled up, John? Well. I'm a big uh, golf fan, and being a golf fan has been quite tricky sort of morally over the past couple of years. And I stopped. I used to be a bit of a football fan, but not like an actor. I didn't go to many games just because I don't I find them too stressful. But I basically called time on my relationship with football because I felt it was so in unjust the World Cup in Qatar. Um, I think they had the Euros in Russia. Oh yeah, yeah it was the, like going. It was like basically hitting all of the places where yeah, their the human rights kind of record, track record was a uh, the consistent failure to really do anything about racism, and not just a f- the failure to do anything about it, but the sort of fines that teams would get. You're talking like twenty grand, for which in the context. Chanting. Which, in the context of how much money these... I mean, it's insane. So that becomes then a tacit um, approval of racism. And then stuff about players and, you know, various amounts of money involved, the sorts of people involved in buying clubs and the general negativity from everyone involved in football about everything in football. Just I just thought, I'm, I'm, out, I'm done. I'm out. I can't be passionate about this because it's just so gross. And I thought, well... I, my two sports are now going to be cricket and golf because they are decent, upstanding. You know, they're played in the spirit of the game. You know, great to sort of moments of sportsmanship. And then there was the racism scandal at Yorkshire Cricket Club. Yes. And then there Timing, was... Timing, the, John. <laughs> yeah, then there was the, the live golf saga began. So for those who don't know... There are there are two main golf tours. There's the European Tour, which is also now known as the DP World Tour, and there's the PGA Tour, which is in America. And players can sort of play on both tours, and they earn points. And you know, depending on your points or how much money is available, you might pick and choose a bit where to play. And then you compete for the four major championships, uh, which players from both tours can qualify for. And those four majors are like you know, every sport has its big grandstand events. So anyway. About two years ago, an ex-player called Greg Norman got together with uh, a load of sort of this, this big wealth fund called PIF, which is a Saudi uh, wealth fund. They own Newcastle Football Club. They're investing in lots of sports. Um, it's it, They have an enormous amount of money and because they are linked to the, the Saudi state and obviously the Saudi state, the Saudi royal family preside over a a country with um, very questionable, well, not just questionable, very poor human rights laws. And um, anyway, so they decide to set up a rival tour. And the way that they're able to attract people from the PGA and the DP World Tour, which are very historic tours, is to go, I'll give you, and I'm not joking here, $200 million dollars. Just to sign with us. Right. $200 million. You get big sponsorship deals if you're in sort of like the top 50 golfers. So the sponsorship deals are insane. However, if you play in a tournament, halfway through the tournament, after two days, they just get rid of the the bottom half. Yeah, and they get nothing. That's called the cut. So they get nothing. uh, And the people left in the cut then compete for the prize money, which is very, very significant amounts of money. You know, you're talking millions to win I think the race to Dubai is tens of millions, which is a tournament that runs throughout the year. So these these people are very, very well remunerated. However, there were certain elements of the game that this tour was, this sort of uh, Saudi-backed tour was trying to address. So the fact that 
four days is quite a big ask for a TV viewing audience. They shortened it to um, to three days. They had team events. There's no real team events on the other tours. They were trying to make it a bit more flashy, a bit more like kind of T20 is to cricket or the 100 is to cricket. But everyone goes nuts because it's sports washing, basically. Some players take the money and, and leave, which then they get banned from the PGA and the DP tour. So then it becomes sort of goodies versus baddies, which is a bit oversimplistic because PGA events are still sponsored by, you know, banks and Saudi <laughs> companies. There's still, there's still right, money in because the... Because there's sort of only ever one or two degrees, I find, within the world of in the world of anything, how everything is sponsored, how everything is funded, how everything is... You know, like years and years ago, I did an ad. Another comedian was like, I can't believe you did an advert. And I was like, but you're writing on 8 out of 10 cats, which is on Channel 4, which is paid for by commercials. So like a lot of the time, this is you're only ever one or two degrees away from something you fundamentally might disagree with. 100%. And also morality is entirely subjective. All we're ever doing is drawing lines for ourselves, right? So for example... I would not do an advert for a gambling company because I used to have a gambling problem and I have a real problem with the the way the gambling industry works. It's However, advertised and marketed and regulated. Yeah. However, I would have, when I was drinking, do an advert for an alcohol company. I never right. did. I never got asked. But, you know. Yeah. So my line there is I won't do gambling because I have a personal problem with it. I, I don't mind doing alcohol. In fact, I've done like... On podcasts, I've done little reads for alcohol companies. I know that people have problems with alcohol, but I didn't see the industry as being as complicit in those problems as the gambling industry. So all we're all doing is drawing a line. Yes. However, I think what happened with Liv is because it was so transactional, it was literally, hey, you may not get to play in a major anymore. You may not be eligible for the Ryder Cup. You might be banned by the PGA Tour, but here's 200 million quid because it was so obvious what was going on. Close your eyes, plug your ears and just take the ba- grab the bag of money. Absolutely. Right. I think people found it quite distasteful. Um, so anyway, what's annoyed me, or it's not really annoyed me, it's just depressed me, is that this big battle was going on. They were, both sides were suing each other. Players were banned. You know, It was literally like pick a team. So a couple of weeks ago, they announced with no warning, not contacting any of the players, that the two bodies were merging. So Liv and the PGA, well, Liv, uh, well, the PGA and the the investment fund, the PIF, were merging to form a new body. And basically what that means is the money always wins, which, you know, has been the case throughout civilization ever since there's been commerce. But it's just depressing. Well, that feels like is the PGA is going to the players don't take this dirty money. We don't want you to take this money. This money's dirty. No, we want to take the dirty money. (laughs) Then we'll decide how we distribute it to the players. We'll take the power out of your hand, out of the hands of the golfers, and we'll take that and then decide. You shouldn't take it as dirty. I mean, we're going to take it, Yeah, you shouldn't. (laughs) It's the hypocrisy at the very top. And especially, I mean, if I was a player who'd been offered 100 million to sign with another golf tour... And I'd agonised over it and I'd seen the reaction other players were getting and I'd spoken to the tour and they'd said, no, fight this, we're fighting this, stick with us, stick with us. And I'd gone, OK. And then they, I'd got a text message from a mate saying, have you seen the news? And I found they'd merged. I would be absolutely apoplectic because they were asking people to make a moral decision and they have then completely thrown that out is that rory mcelroy's in that position then because he was very much all in on the on the side of the pga the rory's probably the person i feel most sorry for i mean that's limited sympathy because he's (laughs) probably made he's i think he would have made about 500 million in his career yeah um but he he was basically i think probably bit of pressure was put on him to be the sort of big spokesperson for the PGA to kind of be the Mr. Squeaky Clean, you know, party line guy. And fair play, he threw himself into that. He was at meetings, he was doing press conferences. He basically became an executive bureaucrat for the PGA Tour, (laughs) which has affected his performance because he's spending so much time in board meetings. And then I would imagine they would have warned him, but I doubt it was much more than a couple of hours 
And now he's in press conferences. He said the press conference he had to do after the news got announced was the most stressful moment of his career. I would be absolutely livid, but I would also have probably five hundred million pounds. So I'd also be able to play golf really well. Um, <laughs> you play golf quite well. Do you not play golf? What's your handicap? A fourteen point three. Is that good? Minute. That sounds quite good. That's quite low. It's okay. It? It's slightly better than average, I think. I mean, I've said that like I, like I know, like I, I have a husband who plays golf, and I, I've done a pitch and putt once, and I'm not very good. I think it would be very frustrating to spend time on a golf course with me. I like the idea of it. I like all of that green. I like walking. But uh, like, I like the possibility of the mental health aspects. That's a big reason that my husband likes it. He's like, I just get out there, just look at the green, whack a couple of balls, have a chat with my pals. It sounds so, like you'd make a very good caddy. Because I that's all of the sort of the exercise, the fresh air, the nature, um, but none of the actual hitting of the balls. Yes, that's, I'll be a caddy. That's what I'll offer to caddy for him. But then I have to, do I have to like polish his clubs? That sounds like a euphemism. You do. You have, well, I mean, we can take it a step further. You actually have to clean his balls. Oh, no, John, come on. It's a family friendly show. It's not. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing your uh, topical story with us. It's time for what we call an unpopular opinion. Mm. Hit me. Something you love everyone else hates or something you hate that everyone else loves. I love doing my accounts and paying <gasps> my taxes. I absolutely <laughs> love it. Okay. So the I think the paying the taxes, I think we can all agree is good. It's good to pay tax. We participate in society and we get things back for the money we put in. I think the actual process of doing them is, for me, one of the most stressful times of the year. Like, I... And you love that. What well, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> well, it's because it's not one time of the year, Tiff. This is how you this is how you make accountancy a joy. It's a it's a weekly it's a weekly privilege, not a yearly stress. <laughs> okay. And I you know, I always one of the first thing my accountant said to me when I got an accountant, I've been sort of guessing at it myself for a couple of years, which was really is really stressful. Because you're being asked to have a skill set with no, no like training whatsoever. When you're self-employed doing your accounts yourself, it's a nightmare. Uh, but I got and an also, accountant. also these are things that I and I've said this before. I will say again, these are one of the things in school they should teach you how to do. This is like part of it. This should be part of education, and it's yeah. not there. Anyway, yeah. I mean, why they don't have like a sort of, you know, basic finance sort of course at school, which is mortgages, current accounts, savings accounts, ISAs, tax, you know, insurance. Those six things would set you up so well. You don't need to do it once a week just to give you the sort of basic groundings in it. I, I mean, it blows my mind because that's the practical ap application of sort of maths and stuff. But... um the first thing he said to me was, make sure you keep rolling accounts. Open a spreadsheet. At the end of every week, put your expenses in one, your your earnings in the other. And then all that you have to do at the end of the year is match them up with your bank account. And I could, I could understand that. I could get my head around that. And then they invented accountancy software. And oh, man, it's just, it's so neat. It's the <laughs> neatness. Because... I hope you're not getting horny here, John. <laughs> But, you know, in our jobs, if especially if you're creative and you work as someone creative, you're always striving for like something you'll never get, which is, you know, the perfect, the perfect bit of art or bit of creativity, the perfect, I don't know whether it's a design or I guess design, maybe you can be perfect, but certainly in stand up, I'd never, I've never had the perfect performance of the perfect show because it's always different. But I know when I get home that it was 140 miles there and back that I can claim uh, 45p per mile, 55p if I've got someone else in the car. I know that that's 2.67 pence of VAT per mile. I know that my meal was 8.99, of which X amount is VAT. I know that when I put those into the 
accounting software and it says reconciled and everything goes green. And then at the end of the year, my accountant says, right, I need all your figures. And I'm like, they're all there. I don't know. I mean, I literally uh, don't even have to press it's one like button. like handing your homework in early. That's the feeling yeah. you're talking about. It's going, my homework's done. Whereas everyone else is like, I haven't done my homework. Not only yeah, haven't yeah. I done my homework, I haven't done it for months. Ah! <laughs> but I get, I get what you're saying. I think what you're saying is creativity is so open-ended and open to interpretation, but maths is fixed. So creativity is open-ended. Mathematics is in Ingoing, out, in and out, expenditure, um, income. Yeah. Ma- the maths is, it's final, it's finite. It's not and infinite. Whereas creativity is this thing that, you know, with, with we have to stop ourselves during shows because otherwise, I always say like a, an imperfect thing at the right time is better than a perfect thing at the wrong time because we can spend so much time trying to make something perfect, 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 perfect. And then the moment for it has passed or the cultural timing and everything else disappears because you can never get it perfect but you can do maths yeah and you know the 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 satisfaction of of being able to chase that mistake back through the figures to find out what you've done wrong which is always just like you've got the wrong drop down menu or you've got the decimal place in the wrong wrong um wrong places it's it's worth it. It's actually worth it. I remember when I used to when I first started having to do VAT returns, which I did find very difficult. Get my head around the concept of it. When the numbers don't add up, and you take an hour to go back through every single bit, and you find the little blighter, it was three eighty nine, <laughs> not thirty eight ninety nine. Well, it's problem solving, right? So yeah, if I- you have an analytical break, I think there's yeah, there's so much. We're in a business where. And maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I should lean into the satisfaction of getting enjoyment out of just doing the admin because I'm terrible with admin and my ADHD. And I'm, uh, but there is something to be said for that because we're in a, a business that has very few certainties. So it's like, am I going to get this gig? Are they going to book me on this show? Am I going to mm. sell tour tickets here? Am I going to be able to, how is this new hour going to be received? And all of those are just like the variables that we live in as a job, you know, um, and then to have something where you go, oh, well, you know what the outcomes are. If you do the steps, then, you know, someone said to me, I think it was Lottie on this podcast that she liked baking because she was like, you follow a recipe and the steps are there. And so if you do all of the things in the way that they say that you should do it, you'll get the end result. Yeah. And it would be nice to end a show if like a show didn't go very well to end by saying, I'm sorry tonight didn't really sort of fire off in all the right places but just to let you know I will be claiming exactly what I've spent and uh, declaring all of the income <laughs> from this so so some things have gone well but it, it like ties into my sort of attempt at a new relationship with anger and frustration because anger can be useful if say you're I don't know, if you're a politician and there's injustice that makes you angry, that drives you to bring about change. Or if you're an activist, or if you have some way of changing things, anger can be very um, a very useful fuel. However, I'm not an activist. Uh, since working for the BBC, I can't even express political opinions on social media. So anger about the state of the world is actually no use to me at the minute. But I at least I know when I pay my taxes... You know, even if I don't agree with how the government is spending that money, you can kind of say, well, I've done my bit. <laughs> yeah, I've done the minimum possible, really. And I can affect change by the way I behave around people and, you know, giving money away to, ch- to charities or whatever. But here's a here's a chunk of money. And I just hope that some percentage of that gets through to help people who are um, harmed by policies that I don't agree with. Um but you know, when if if there comes a time when I am able to express my political opinions online, it'll be all guns blazing, all Johns blazing. Yeah, I think that's the first time anyone's brought something that I was like, I'm genuinely shocked to hear that you love accounting. But your reasons for it are so great, and are making me think that I should maybe just enjoy the process a oh, bit yeah. more. It's all about the process, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing your unpopular opinion. Um, Before we wrap up the podcast, 
uh, it is tradition for me to ask where people can catch you. I know we mentioned very briefly at the top that you will be at Edinburgh, but what have you got coming up? Where can they find more John content? Well, uh, I'm doing t- two shows in Edinburgh. I'm doing um, a, a show called Howl, um, H-O-W-L, which is uh, sort of last year's work in progress show, all polished up. And then I'm doing a work in progress in Edinburgh. Um, and then after Edinburgh, I, I combine those two shows for a tour, which starts uh, on in September, runs till the end of December. Um, and that tour show is also called Howl. Um, tickets you can get from johnrobbins.com and um, Ellis and I have just started releasing episodes of a new series of a podcast we have called How Do You Cope which is where we talk to people about uh, various traumas and struggles they've experienced in their lives and regular radio show on a Friday and I've just finished my tenure as landlord at an imaginary pub in a podcast <laughs> called Moon Underwater, but that podcast will be continuing with a different landlord. Thank you for joining me today, John. It's been funny and insightful and great just to catch up with you, really. I just yeah, enjoy you catching too. up with you. I haven't seen you for so long. Yes. Um, yeah, it's great to catch up. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We'll see you next time. You can listen to other programmes from The Bugle, including The Bugle, Catharsis, Tiny Revolutions, Top Stories and The Gargle wherever you find your podcasts.